It has been one year since Spider-Man No Way Home was released in theaters. Since its release, it has received mostly positive reviews, a major following, and has become one of the highest grossing movies of all time. No Way Home successfully united the ever-so-divided Spider-Man fanbase for a short period of time with its use of characters from throughout Spider-Man's live-action run. For the first few months, this movie seemed to have successfully made its way into everyone's hearts. That is, until March 2022. The Batman is DC's newest take on the classic character of the same name, and similar to No Way Home, received mostly positive reviews, has a major following, and broke records. But when this movie's success began, No Way Homes began to be in question. Batman's more grounded and serious approach to the character was the polar opposite of No Way Home's fantastical and more absurd moments. This brought the common criticism among fans that No Way Home is dumb and relies purely on fan service, like many of Marvel's other Phase 4 projects. Almost a year later, the Batman is still praised while No Way Home seems to be forgotten, but are all these criticisms true, and does No Way Home truly live up to the hype? Spider-Man No Way Home picks up immediately where its predecessor, Far From Home, ended. Peter Parker's identity has been revealed to the world by Mysterio as he frames Peter for murder, and in the months after this reveal, it is only negatively affecting everyone Peter cares about, even though they did nothing wrong. After MJ and Ned are rejected from MIT for being associated with him, Peter gets the wild idea to visit Doctor Strange to try and undo the damage Mysterio has caused. With disapproval from Wong, Strange decides to cast a spell to make everyone in the world forget Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Peter tries to alter the spell mid-casting and it becomes corrupted, allowing everyone in the multiverse who knows Peter is Spider-Man access to the main timeline. Yeah, yeah, I know. That is, until Strange contains the spell and he then scolds Peter for not even attempting to reason with MIT before asking him to do the spell to which Peter decides to finally try and reason with MIT. Before he gets the chance to, it's revealed that some people were able to slip into the main timeline. Peter proceeds to save the MIT Mixer from Doc Ock, and in doing so gets Ned, MJ, and himself into MIT. But before he could celebrate, Strange breaks the news to him that there are multiple characters who slip through, including the Lizard, Electro, Sandman, and the Green Goblin. Before sending the villains back, Peter finds out that most of the villains die fighting Spider-Man and feels responsible to give them a second chance. Strange, on the other hand, thinks that their deaths shouldn't be prioritized over the main universe's stability. Strange then proceeds to lose a fight with Peter and is locked in the mirror dimension for the rest of the film. After talking to the villains for a bit, they all agree to raid Happy's apartment so Peter can cure them and send them home. After successfully curing Doc Ock and starting on Electro's cure, the Goblin crashes his little party, turning all the villains against him, killing Aunt May in the process, before leaving Peter to deal with the police. After May dies, Peter retreats to the roof of his school, which MJ claims is his place to get away from things. MJ and Ned meet up with him, and reveal the other two Peters from the villains' universes. After taking a moment to talk about May's death, they all work together to cure the villains because Peter believes that's what May would have wanted. This plan culminates in the Peters luring the villains to the Statue of Liberty and curing them one by one. About midway through the battle, Strange escapes from the mirror dimension and takes the box back to send them home. Peter tries to bargain with Strange one last time, but is interrupted by the Goblin's attempt to steal the box. He fails to steal it, but successfully destroys it, setting the spell loose after Strange fails to contain it once more. More villains show up in the sky, and the multiverse begins to tear itself apart. Peter confronts the Goblin and attempts to kill him with his glider, but is stopped by Raimi's Peter. After Goblin stabs Raimi's Peter, MCU Peter injects him with his cure, killing the Goblin and saving Norman. Peter then confronts Strange about what happened and decides to set a new spell to undo the old one, which would make everyone forget who Peter Parker is. After giving his goodbyes to Strange, the other Peters, and his best friend and girlfriend, Strange casts the spell, sending everyone back and making everyone forget who Peter Parker is. A few weeks later, Peter visits MJ at her job and attempts to reconnect with her, but goes back on him. At the end of the movie, we see Peter visit May's grave and talk to Happy, who also forgot who he is. 
After this, we see him move into his new apartment and then get a look at his new suit as he goes to fight crime in Manhattan. So I'll just get the elephant in the room out of the way. This is a really dumb movie. The first major issue is not entirely this movie's fault, but is carried over from the last one. But the way the identity reveal is handled is really dumb. There is so much evidence that Mysterio is faking the whole thing, like video evidence from witnesses, but the movie just kind of goes with it for some reason. The rules of the spell aren't entirely explained either. There are three groups of characters that all create their own problems. Starting off with the simple ones, the different Peters. Maybe I'm really stupid, but I don't see how the spell that pulls people that know Peter as Spider-Man would pull not one, but two of Peter himself. Is it because he knows he's Spider-Man? Again, maybe I'm stupid, but the movie never cares to explain how the Peters are affected by the spell. The next group is Eddie, Venom, and Electro, who both don't know who Peter is, and don't tell me about the hive mind because that's bullshit. Electro, you could say his universe is slightly different, and maybe he knew in that universe, but Venom makes no sense no matter how you put it. First of all, Eddie doesn't know who the hell Peter is even after the hive mind thing, so why would he be pulled with Venom, since they are both two different people? Also, why is this specific Venom pulled when there are characters left over from the Raimi and Webb films that would probably get priority since those are the main universes being affected? Like both Harry Osborns and Topher Grace, Venom being in this movie makes no sense, but since that's just a post credit scene problem, I'll move on. The final group consists of the remaining villains, Goblin, Lizard, Doc Ock, and Sandman. This group creates the question of, when were they pulled from? This one is actually really simple, but a small thing sets it all off. Judging off what we see from Ock and Venom, we can assume all the characters are pulled from when they find out Peter is Spider-Man. Ock is pulled from the final battle, Venom is pulled from his post credit scene where he finds out about Spider-Man. With this knowledge, you could assume Lizard is pulled after the sewer fight, and his universe just has a slight difference like the others with character designs. And Norman was pulled after the dinner scene, which creates another problem of him having his goblin suit when he's pulled, but that's something easy to look over. The problem here is Sandman, which is a major problem throughout the entire film, but I'll get into that in a second. Sandman would realistically be pulled from the subway fight if this logic applied to everyone, but he is pulled after the battle with Venom which kind of throws this whole thing apart, because then Lizard should just be normal Connors, Ock should already have control over the arms, and Norman should look like he got his ass kicked a few minutes ago. Yeah, you get my point. Getting more into the issues Sandman has in this film, it's pretty much a character assassination. In Spider-Man 3, Sandman's entire motive is his daughter. He's not a bad guy and would have no reason not to trust Peter or go against Peter's plans, because it aligns with his personal beliefs. But the film feels the need to make him another one of the villains for no reason. His entire motive in this movie is pretty much that he is impatient. During the final battle, he would benefit from helping the Spider-Men because both Electro and Lizard are trying to destroy the box. And the worst part is there's an easy fix for this. Remember how I said Sandman would have been pulled from the subway fight if he was consistent with every other character in the film? Yeah, if he was pulled from there, he'd have a reason not to trust Peter and go against him. And he would believe he died, and if he believed he died, all five villains would have a reason not to go home. The only thing that would need to be changed is him helping Peter in the first fight with Electro. It's that simple. Other characters being off include Electro, Ock, and Goblin. There isn't much to dig in, so I'll just make these quick. Once the villains turn on Peter, Doc Ock decides to run away even though his new goal is to help Peter and these villains so they can go home, which makes him seem like a moron, but luckily, that's only this scene, so I'm willing to let it slide. Electro goes from a loser who thinks he's a god to just Jamie Foxx, which I think makes him a really fun character and I can't blame them for changing him, but he barely resembles the original and I still have to bring it up. Goblin carries over the inconsistent motive problem from his original debut, but he's at least somewhat consistent in this film, so once again, could let it slide. To elaborate on this, Goblin's motive in the original film is to get revenge on the people who kicked Norman out of Oscorp. He succeeds at his goal halfway through the movie. 
and now has a personal vendetta against Spider-Man because he tried to stop him? Yeah, 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 I know. After this, his motive completely changes and he wants to rule the world or something, which carries over for this single scene in No Way Home. Coward. We have a new world to conquer. Excluding this scene, Goblin is pretty consistent in this film and any changes made were for the good of the story, so I will let them slide. Strange is also inconsistent, but this is due to the last minute rewrites to have him fill America Chavez's role. There's a bunch of smaller things too, but I believe I covered the main one, so I think it's time we move to the next section. When No Way Home came out, it became one of my favorite comic book movies. I loved everything about it. The story, the characters, the emotions it was able to put me through that most films could not. And after pointing all these issues out about this film, I still hold the same opinion on the film as I did when I first saw it. This is not a perfect film by any means, but it is clear that it's made with nothing but love for the character. Through its messy and flawed story is a film that captures the soul of Spider-Man, and in doing so becomes a messy love letter to the character and the almost 20 years of Spider-Man on the big screen. This is one of the few films that I believe uses its nostalgia and fan service in a clever way. Even if you remove connections to the Raimi and Webb films, No Way Home still operates exactly the same with all its themes and its story. Yes, this movie is dumb. It is very, very dumb. But in a weird way, it works in the movie's favor. Yes, it could have been better, but for what it is, I think it deserves much of the praise it has received. So to answer the question, does No Way Home live up to the hype? Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs>